Tonight we continue our exploration of the brain and the mysteries of consciousness. For this program we consider agnosia. Agnosia is a neurological condition which results in an inability to recognize people, objects, sounds, shapes, or smells. While the defect is in the brain rather than in specific senses, agnosic patients still perceive the world differently. Prosopagnosia, or face blindness, affects an estimated 2.5% of the population. With this disorder, patients cannot consciously recognize faces. This means they may not identify their own family or even themselves when looking into a mirror. Tonight, so the I, artist I Chuck Close speaks with us. He has face blindness nature. and yet creates large-scale portraits, paintings. Also joining me this evening, a remarkable group of scientists, John you Bruce, Professor of Clinical Neurology at the Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons, Masood Hussein, Professor of Neurology at the University College London and a Senior Fellow of the Wellcome Trust, Richard Frakowiak, Professor of Neurology at the University of Lausanne and Head of the Department of Clinical Neurosciences. And once again, my co-host, Dr. Eric Kandel. He is a Nobel laureate, a professor at Columbia University and a Howard Hughes medical investigator. We began our conversation asking this question. So what's our subject tonight? Last time we considered consciousness. Today we're going to consider selective defects in consciousness. These are called agnosias. People with visual agnosia, for example, uh, can see an object quite well, uh, but can't name it. They don't understand what it's used for. And the whole idea of agnosia has a fascinating history. Uh, amazingly enough, the term was coined by Sigmund Freud. Uh, we think of Sigmund Freud as the founder of psychoanalysis, uh, and the interpretation of dreams was sort of the founding text of that. Uh, that was 1900, but for about 15 years before that, he was a great neuroanatomist and a fine clinical neurologist. And in 1891, he wrote a classic text on aphasia, these are disorders of language, and in it he coined the term agnosia. By that he meant that people in a variety of spheres have difficulty knowing exactly what the object is. It's a, de it's a deficiency in knowledge. So for example, a person with visual agnosia might look at this cup, see that it's white, see that it's round, see that it sits in something flat, but he would not realize that this is a cup and use it for drinking. This amazing insight that you can have a selective defect uh, in knowledge, agnosia, has stayed with us to the present time. Moreover, uh, what would have pleased Freud perhaps even more than realizing that this terminology persisted was that although we don't know the mechanism for most types of agnosia, one kind of model that is being actively entertained right now is one that we considered last time. Could I have the next image, please? Uh, last time we pointed out that perception really occurs in two phases, an unconscious perception and a conscious perception. In the unconscious perception, what you do is you light up the back of the brain as is indicated here. So if you look at an object, the visual area, the primary visual area, maybe some of the surrounding areas light up. But you're really not consciously aware of it. When you become consciously aware, the information propagates its broadcast to the front of the brain. And it is thought that for certain kinds of agnosias, the difficulty is moving the information from its initial reception to its further propagation to the anterior parts of the brain. Uh, now, there are clearly you know, many different forms of agnosia, and John is going to outline uh, the different forms of four major types. And he's going to particularly focus uh, on people who have difficulty perceiving the defect of the illness, being unaware of the symptoms that they have, even though they're obvious to everyone around. Masuda specializes in neglect and is going to describe to us many forms of that. And there are some fascinating aspects of that. These are, for example, cases in which something is obviously in front of you, but for a variety of reasons, you don't uh, notice it. Uh, there's a fascinating example of hemi-neglect in which you have a lesion of the brain uh, in which you don't see the opposite side of the world. Uh, so you, when you draw something, you really only draw half the image, you don't draw the other image. So we're going to hear about the various kinds of uh, a, a, a defects that, that we see with these agnosias. Uh, Richard has pioneered the use of functional magnetic resonance imaging 
has done a lot of very important work with it. And that has been particularly important for allowing us to understand perception of faces. May I have the next image, please? Um, one of the really interesting agnosias, and one we'll hear about from Chuck Close, is blindness for face. It's called prosignosia. Um, this is people can recognize all kinds of objects, but they have difficulty uh, recognizing a face. And this was discovered uh, in around uh, 1947 by Joachim Bartema, who had several patients. One patient was a young guy who was shot in the head, almost died, survived, everything came back. All of his visual senses, his memory, everything was, but he had difficulty with one thing, he could not recognize faces. He couldn't recognize his family, couldn't recognize friends, he couldn't recognize his own image when he looked in the mirror. Um, he realized that um, there are different forms of hypnosias, of, of prosignosias. They varied somewhat with each other. He saw two other patients that had the same thing. With time, uh, after Bradman came along, one realized that there are two forms, a congenital form and an acquired form. He studied the acquired forms. The congenital form, which is what uh, Chuck Close uh, suffers from, uh, is actually quite common. So two and a half percent of the people have a significant form of prosignosia. Mild forms of prosignosia may be 10 percent of the population. Uh, we also know that it occurs in the infratemporal cortex. Bottomer first suggested it, but we now have very good evidence for it. And if you examine different people with prosignosia, you realize that they really can differ from one, in, uh, from one another in a significant way, suggesting that there isn't simply a single site for face recognition, but a number of processing steps which can be selectively affected. May I have the next image, please? Marge Livingston and her colleagues did a wonderful set of experiments to test this notion. They looked in the temporal cortex uh, and they showed monkeys, and later they confirmed this in people, images of faces. And they lit up not one area, but five different face patches. Moreover, in the monkey, they could record from them electrically and they could stimulate one and activate the others, realizing this is an interconnected system they could now record from individual face patches and they could show that when you showed a monkey, an image of a monkey or an image of a human, the cells in that patch would fire like mad. They could now use a cartoon of that face and the cells would fire like mad. But then they discovered this follows a gestaltist principle. If you simplify the face at all, the cell stops responding. So if you have an outline of the face and just two eyes or just a mouth, the cells don't respond. So this is, the whole is more than the sum of the parts. You have to see the whole face or at least a significant part of it in order to get the cells to respond. And they were able to show that several interesting features that explain our visual perception of faces, you can see in these face patches. We respond dramatically to cartoons, to exaggeration of faces. These cells go wild if you exaggerate a face, if you spread the eyes apart, or if you bring the eyes together again. And of course, your and my favorite prosignosic is right here. Right. This man is absolutely remarkable. Not only is he face blind, but he's a spectacular portrait artist. So can you imagine making this your profession when you have a difficult time perceiving it? Uh, and Chuck will tell us how he does this despite the fact that he has a significant handicap. But I think in a larger sense, and one of the reasons you and I admire him so much, is he shows really the depth of human intelligence, creativity, and character. And it tells you, number one, there's not a single kind of intelligence. There are multiple intelligences. There's not a single kind of creativity. You can be creative in a number of ways. And, and he has implied this when we talked about another context, that being handicapped in some areas may allow the plasticity of the brain mm -hmm. to emerge and to give you new capabilities that you might otherwise not have. So we'll have a chance to Chuck, have Chuck tell us about his gifts. So we're in for a terrific session. All right, let me begin with John Bruce.